here, so we are recording. Our agenda today, I'm just going to spend a couple minutes. We're going to do some rapid fire introductions uh, as we've tried to do. It looks like there's a lot of new people, so we'll do it quick. And then uh, we'll spend about 10 minutes doing updates uh, from uh, the Let's Get Technical, uh, a couple of things that have uh, been updated in the last week or two, uh, both on the site and uh, in some developments. Uh, and then uh, Dave Walsh uh, and some of our other members who are part of the Let's Get Technical, our proof of concept, Project Unify, will just give a couple of uh, some minute kind of overview on where that's heading and that's starting to pick up some speed and some acceleration. And then we'll move right into um, really the gravity presentation by Evelyn. And that will take the bulk of the time, um, which will probably be about an hour. And we've designed that so that um, it's uh, meant to be interactive, so that as uh, and there's certain places that will pause for conversation, mm -hmm. um, but um, but again, feel free. This is meant to be um, a learning opportunity, not just a one-way presentation. So let me um, uh, just spend a couple minutes now um, doing uh, uh, and in some introductions. Oh, actually, let's do introductions before I do this. Um, and let's see, this is going to be ambitious. The way we've done this in the past is if you go to your chat box, uh, for anyone who wants to introduce themselves who's new, and you write your name in that chat box, I will call on you and you get to say who you are and where you're at and where you're coming from, where you're calling from. So uh, we'll just do it fast. It's not meant to be a speech or anything, just a hello, welcome kind of thing. Uh, so I think we have a few folks here. Uh, let's start. Uh, Jeff, thanks for stepping forward. Just uh, uh, turn off, you know, turn on your mic and say hello. Where you're from and what you what you do during the day. You bet. This is Jeff Messer. I'm a consultant with Public Knowledge. I'm in Denver, Colorado, and uh, we work with a number of HIEs uh, and state governments across the country. Super. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Slocum. I am co-director of the Program to Improve Elder Care at Altarum Institute in Ann Arbor, mm -hmm. Michigan. We work mm -hmm. uh, in a variety of different ways to try to, as our title says, improve elder care, some of which include <laughs> uh, trying to help community-based organizations become uh, more interoperable or at least functional in the uh, HIT environment. Welcome. <clears throat> Hi, so Forrest White. Yes, hello, it's Forrest White. I work with Altarum as well, actually with Sarah. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And uh, uh, Craig Newman also is on the line with us. Um, and we all work in the in the space with um, interoperability, some HL7 standards. Uh, we've worked with a little bit with the ELTSS initiative as well. So we're certainly mm -hmm. interested in the uh, social determinants. Awesome, that's, Thank you. that's great. So I'll, I will expect you guys to sort of huddle uh, offline or online mute and come up with a real tough question for us okay. <laughs> or, 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 or a insightful uh, uh, comment there. Derek Corson, welcome back. Hi, Derek. Say hello. Hi, Daniel. Uh, Derek Corson. I'm consultant primarily work right now with the New York City and New York State Departments of Health. Great. Welcome. Good to hear you. Nicole. Hi, uh, Nicole Blumenfeld. I am with 211 San Diego and the Community Information Exchange. And we are a nonprofit that, uh, that uh, works in the intersection of social determinants and also health using technology to connect both um, community partners, but also data, uh, data integrations to kind of use a platform to share information and better serve our community. Welcome, thank you. Jim Kirkwood. Hi, I'm Jim Kirkwood from the New York State Department of Health. Um, in our division, we work on our overseeing our health information exchanges in New York State regulation, funding, getting money, getting funding from CMS. Also work closely with our Medicaid um, agency to help them implement and use some of the infrastructure we build out using our health information exchanges and are very interested in some of the work that's going on with, um, with Gravity in particular. Fantastic. Great. Angie Brown. Angie, we don't hear you if you are on. There you go. Looks like you unmuted. You there? Hello. This is Brian Hanspicker. Just want to give a shout out to New York State. Um, I was the original architect for 
what ended up being uh, the child passport um, collection of healthcare, prescription, educational, criminal, et cetera, information. Thanks, Brian, for filling the void. Angie, are you back with us now? All right, you may need to dial back in. Uh, Lisa Watanabe. Hi, all. This is Lisa Watanabe. I'm with Healthier Here, based in Seattle. We're the Accountable Community of Health, and uh, excited to see 211 San Diego on here because we are hoping to start up a community information mm -hmm. exchange in this area yeah. in 2020. Fantastic. Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody. And um, if I missed anybody, uh, now is the moment to say hello. Hi, everyone. Go ahead. <laughs> Reagan Faust here from the Children's Data Network at USC. Hey, Reagan. Welcome. Hi. This is Matt Packard with the CIE in San Diego. Hi, Nicole. Hello, everyone. Last word. Anyone else? Good morning, everyone. This is Rich Bull, and I'm with Northwoods, and I, I head up our child welfare uh, practice for Northwoods. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Great. Welcome. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, let's move on here. Um, if you feel inspired uh, during the call, by all means, jump in. So, um, so uh, just uh, for, there are a lot of new people on the on the call here, and. Uh, just take a minute here to describe the National Interoperability Collaborative. It's um, something we've started, we've been working on it a couple of years, really kind of hit, uh, hit our stride uh, about a year ago when we really launched the, the platform and have been uh, putting out a lot of communications. It's uh, a, 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 an initiative funded by the Kresge Foundation and it's part of Stewards of Change Institute. And it's, uh, we think about it and refer to it as a community of networks. Uh, in the sense that um, we recognize there's a lot of things going on out in the world and that we're um, looking to help uh, be the interstitial tissue between the different domains mm -hmm. that are working to improve health, safety, well-being, operations. And we've, uh, we think about the world in terms of, uh, in a simplified way, and I apologize for everybody who doesn't see themselves in these six domains, but you're, you're in there or could be in there in terms of human services, public health, education, public safety, emergency medical response, and healthcare and IT, healthcare and IT. So we, we organize the world in that way. Uh, we know there's a lot of things missing from there as well, but as a way to get started, um, we did a, a paper for HIMSS a couple of years ago looking at the uh, similarities and differences between those uh, across things like policy, funding, strategy, and some of the opportunities and have been really thinking about how do we, the work we do should have applicability across not only the specific domain of health or human services, but also how do we think about it going horizontally? Because ultimately the topic of today is social determinants, right? And that's a pretty broad um, <clears throat> approach to thinking holistically about people. And especially people in crisis usually touch two, three, four, five, or all of these uh, different domains or systems the more interoperable we can be in our own domain and across domains, the better off it is. So um, uh, that's really the foundation for the NIC and that's what we're driving towards in terms of trying to attract uh, subject matter experts and people who are interested in each of the domains and then to facilitate conversations like today, which is really both within a domain but across domains. And I think that's a unique place that um, <clears throat> I'm hoping more and more conversations can happen like that because I think there's a lot of, I think there's a significant return on investment uh, if we get that going and learn from each other about what's happening. <clears throat> and I'm trying to advance my screen here. Sometimes it's not being cooperative. So um, so the Collaboration Hub, uh, I'm proud to say, I'm actually excited to say, we, we uh, submitted a, a, um, uh, a nomination for uh, a very prestigious award. It's called the Davy Award. And uh, we took... Uh, Three silver awards. Just we just learned about this last week, in terms of uh, web-based applications in various fields, and uh, it's um, it's exciting, especially for those of you who are aware of uh, the importance of communication and networking. And so um, we're proudly displaying that, and uh, we're happy to have received the uh, recognition of a variety of different organizations. You can you can look more about Davies uh, as you go forward, but they're involved with a lot of different organizations. 
And um, I have to give a shout out to Sunday has been Char Chagra, who's on our, our call here, is our webmaster and community development manager who has been uh, really making magic with the hub uh, on the platform we've, uh, we're, we've, uh, we've adopted. So um, uh, let me just say a little bit more about, uh, about the, the hub. Uh, we launched it just about a year ago. We're approaching 850 members. There's eight groups. There's over 1,000 resources. People are engaged. You are engaged when you're on. You're um, looking at lots of pages. We were, we're approaching 100,000 page views and over 9,000 visitors. And so um, that is uh, pretty good for a first year. Um, what's exciting to me is the variety and the, um, the different domains that are represented. If you've, if you've uh, signed up already, you'll know we ask you what you're interested in and what you're involved with. And uh, if you go on and look at the member profiles, you'll see that we're really starting to fill out uh, people, uh, sort of the people with expertise and interest in those various areas. So um, it's a great community. Uh, we, it's a growing community that will hopefully um, um, you know, be of value uh, to you. Um, again, the cross-sector communication, learning knowledge is what it's all about. And um, I'm not going to take the time now. Well, you know what? I'm going to just take a minute here see if this works here. Uh, for those of you who have, have not been on the Hub, um, let me see if I can go on here just for a minute. And is it going to cooperate? Uh, I think so. So we've made a couple of changes. So this is the Hub, if everyone can see it. Uh, if any one of our team members can just say yes, you can see it, that'd be great. No, we are still seeing the slides. You're seeing the slides? OK. Well, let's go back to that then. Um, so. Um, so what we've done is we've made some uh, enhancements on the actual Let's Get Technical group itself. And so what that means basically is uh, there's more guidance about where um, materials are stored. Um, there's a, um, sort of an overview of the Let's Get Technical uh, purpose. Uh, and then there's an easy access to the actual first working group we have, which is uh, the, what we're calling Project uh, um, uh, Unity. And that project is, um, uh, we'll be talking about just momentarily with David. I'm thinking that's what you're seeing here. So if you haven't, please spend some time on the Hub. There's a lot of resources, and it's a great place to really start to connect with folks um, and uh, learn what's up there. So um, uh, with that, let me, I think, uh, I think what I'm doing is turning this over to, uh, to Dave now for a, a, just a few moments to give a, a bit of an overview on Unify. And, uh, and then we'll move into the, uh, into the presentation. So Dave, are you there? I sure am, and I'm off mute now. <laughs> Excellent. Even better. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, welcome, everybody. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of an overview of what uh, Project Unify is. Uh, historically, I had roots in the Medicaid and healthcare space and um, chaired a group there called the Might Attack. And what the Might Attack really did was take emerging technologies and healthcare initiatives and marry those together. So bring emerging technologies into the healthcare space and demonstrate the value proposition that those emerging technologies provided. I uh, met Daniel and Stuart, uh, I'm going to think, five years ago at this point. And recently, we've really been looking at how many of the technologies that are coming out of healthcare and specifically the Medicaid space are also applicable to the domains that uh, Daniel mentioned a little bit ago. In fact, Many, many of the uh, technologies that CMS is going to be releasing rules on, and we believe those rules are going to be somewhere around the first quarter that they're going to release those. But it's about interoperability and how is that achieved. So we've had some discussions and decided it would make a lot of sense to uh, have the Might Attack and uh, the Let's Get Technical group collaborate in making some of these interoperability initiatives become a reality. 
So we've uh, uh, launched a project now called Project Unify, and that is about building a proof of concept implementation of how these technologies can work, not only in the healthcare space, but in the human services space and the domains that uh, Daniel had mentioned. So um, we have really just begun and what the might attack did over uh, the last, you can go to the next slide, Daniel. Um, what the might attack has done over the last couple of years is uh, implemented a proof of concept and we typically show that at the Medicaid conference. Uh, the last couple of years, it has been related to uh, opioid abuse, um, heroin addiction and so forth. So there was a progression in the story that um, took an individual, a lady, Sarah, uh, who got addicted to opioids and so forth. And then ultimately, uh, we collaboratively built a care management solution um, that would allow her caregivers, her care team, to communicate with her. And all of that communication, the parole officer and others, were actually uh, implemented using FIRE interfaces. FIRE standing for Fast Healthcare Interoperability um, uh, Resources. And it showed how the whole care team could collaborate using that technology to address the care of this particular individual. Uh, the following year, we expanded that story. So that story was still in place, but it expanded to include uh, Sarah's son who had gotten into uh, her opioids and Sarah had gotten involved in heroin. Um, so it was a growing complexity uh, in, in terms of the user story, but it gave us a, a focal point for the community to look at it, not just think, okay, they're doing some technical things and that's somewhat interesting. Now we're raising it up to a level of we're addressing a very real world problem so people who are trying to address that can relate to it even better. Now, one of the things we're doing at this point is starting to expand that user story and include uh, aspects of the six domains in that. So one of the things we're doing right now, we've got a, a few people, uh, Tom Silvius from GDIT is one of them who is our principal storyteller, and he's going to be helping to adapt the story to include human services, possibly education, and so forth. Uh, but on this call, we're beginning to ask people to volunteer or to engage with us in that process. So we don't, although we're going to be implementing a real solution using code, something that actually works using these emerging technologies. We need help. We need volunteers that are subject matter experts in the domains themselves uh, that uh, are proficient at telling the story well or helping to document it. So I'd love to hear from people to volunteer and start to engage in this. We're not looking, we are looking at this as being a fairly long running uh, uh, proof of concept and the story will continue to grow and involve more people in the process and more domains in the process. I'll give you one example. Hey Dave, let me, yes. let me interrupt with one thing quickly. Please. One is um, we'll have uh, for people online now, so these calls are weekly um, and so uh, I was going to say this, next week we have a, a, uh, another special guest, uh, Dave Ross, um, from the Information uh, Informatics Institute. 
um, uh, and also the following week will be an open house. And during that following week, we'll go more into the proof of concept and have a chance to really kind of dive into more of the details and the, you know, the, the, the plan going forward. It'll be more of a working session for part of the time. So uh, for those of you who are interested, you know, of course, just reach out either through the, uh, the hub or directly to us to do that. And uh, we can, we'll go into much greater detail. And so Dave, a um, couple more minutes and then we can move on. Sure, sure. Just go to the next slide then, Daniel. Okay. So uh, these are these are aspects that we intend to be uh, focusing on. A, to have a test harness for some of these services and domains. In, in general, it is about uh, understanding these emerging technologies, what the CMS rules are going to be asking us to go do, and reaching across the aisle from healthcare into the human services arena. Uh, one of the topics that I'm sure we're going to be addressing is how do we define data models for the information that's going to be exchanged between these domains? And that's what Evelyn is going to talk about today. Evelyn uh, is a uh, lead in the uh, Gravity Group. And she's going to tell us a little bit about um, what gravity is and where it's going to. Go ahead, Evelyn. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and like, I want to make sure I have my can advance the slide. All right, here we go. So good afternoon again and good morning, everyone, those on the West Coast. I'm delighted to join you today to talk about this, gra this project called the Gravity Project. And so here's our agenda, so just broken it up, you know, give a little bit of background, although I know uh, the why of what we're doing is very clear to this group. Um, and then I'll spend some time on scope, approach, deliverables to date, um, and uh, talk through on um, how this is relevant to all your work. So just quickly, I do want to acknowledge our project team under the leadership of Dr. Laura Gottlieb and Dr. Caroline Fitchtenberg out of SIREN, uh, Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network at the University of California in San Francisco. SIREN initiated this work um, with um, sponsorship from the Robin Wood Johnson Foundation. They engaged my team at EMI Advisors. We're also supported by our two um, subject matter experts for food and security, Sarah DeSilvi and Donna Pertel. And recently we have the American Medical Association leads Monique Van Berkham and Corey Smith helping us with the FIRE implementation guide development. Oh, no, my slides would advance before. Oh, here we go. All right, so let's talk about the why. Um, so we, I always like to start by acknowledging that there is significant um, growing interest in addressing social determinants of health in clinical settings. So this is coming from across um, stakeholder groups. This is just a snapshot of headlines that acknowledge the growing number of investments in this area, many of them being led uh, by the health plan. On September 25th, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine published a comprehensive study on this very topic. Um, I'll speak tomorrow at the end of my slides to include some specific recommendations uh, from the report. Oh, sorry, I don't know why it keeps on advancing. Uh, I don't know if it's... Um, whoops. Sorry, that might have been me. I was looking for okay. the... Uh, I was looking for the... There's a little bit of background noise. Go back, go back a little bit. Sorry about that. Oh, sorry. Away, All right. So, <laughs> um, uh, this report is important because, and there is some background noise. Um, for those that haven't read it yet, it is a lengthy report, but what I find it does an excellent job of highlighting all the recent research and evidence around uh, the importance of integrating social determinants of health in clinical settings, um, as, you know, as well as current uh, recommendations for the industry. So the NAM report also highlights much of what we visualize here. This is from the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement, going beyond clinical walls. 
And it's based very much what we know that healthcare only accounts for a relatively small percentage of our healthcare outcomes. And that the rest is shaped by socioeconomic factors, which we refer to as social determinants of health. And this is important because, uh, especially now, as industry is trying to figure out how to best address these socioeconomic factors as part of healthcare, especially as we shift from fee-for-service models to value-based payment models. So Siren, of course, having done a lot of research in this area to date as part of their mission, encourages us to think of uses of social risk data in these six areas or buckets around medical care, social risk interventions, population health management, risk adjustment, community health improvement, and last, research that is based of all these areas. So let's stop right now. I know, and I do still hear a lot of background noise. Um, our first discussion question, I, I, we do have uh, pauses throughout the presentation. We want this to be more uh, collaborative. So let me ask the community today, what critical social factors or determinants are missing for your program to better meet your patient, client, customer needs? Any thoughts? Oh. So um, one of the things, uh, Evelyn, this is Daniel. Um, um, people may also, um, there is a little bit of background noise, so if you're on there, otherwise we can mute people. But one of the things, we were in conversation yesterday with the, um, the WIND network, uh, which is really interesting, and one of the things they're talking about also are, you know, sort of criminal justice um, measures. So safety, community measures, things like that. And those typically are not showing up as, you know, quote unquote, social factors in terms of one's health or wellness. So um, that was something I was surprised by yesterday in the conversation. I don't know if it's being, I don't know, as you, as you think about it or as the report talks about it, are there other broader things? Because we usually think about transportation, housing, nutrition, food, mm -hmm. you know, the, those things which are, you know, so close in. but. Are there other things, the purpose of this question is, are there other things that you're thinking about from wherever you're standing or sitting that would be important to put onto the agenda? Let me say it that way. And this is Brian Hanspicker. Uh, I would Brian. note that um, a number of what we think of as social determinants of health uh, data elements get asked and nowadays by doctors, um, which is, you know, really reassuring. Um, however, I would also note that each time I've been asked those questions, I've thought, well, now, how many of the people who are being asked those questions are basically lying or prevaricating? <laughs> um, and as a consequence, how much can we make use of, of other uh, information like the Census Bureau information or economic develop, development information, et cetera, to determine what is the likelihood that this particular person is actually uh, suffering from either food insecurity or housing insecurity or uh, uh, economic insecurity, uh -huh. things that can have a radical uh, result um, on their health care. And I say this because I, I happen to live, um, albeit very well, um, <laughs> in, in, in a rural area that is has gone through some very significant economic downturns. And so, so Evelyn, I, I'm, I Evelyn, I'm assuming, I'm assuming you put this up here because you're addressing some of the other issues here. Yeah, and I just, I, we will touch upon it in the coming slides, but I think that's helpful. I think what, Brian, you highlight one of the things that is clarifying and when I get into scope, we, this project is focused on patient level uh, data capture. And I think when you talk about census data, it's not to say that is not important, that is critical. We have population health level um, data capture that is needed. And what we're seeing in the market right now, especially the health plans, they're using both. 
Um, and we'll, I'll talk about either whether it's patient level or population health data capture. What's happening is, you know, the focus of our work, it's not being done so in a standardized way. So therefore minimizes the opportunity to be able to use that data in real time steadfast and have it in a uniform manner. So, and that was exactly I, my I, point. Yeah. That you can mm -hmm. have patient information collected mm -hmm. by the doctor, but it needs to be correlated uh, with uh, local information. Yeah. Not, not okay. just to qualify mm -hmm. the, the patient information but also to provide a kind of a bigger picture of the environment that that particular patient is uh, living in. Absolutely. Hi. And I'll just, uh, I just want to answer that. Um, I know Humana just, but the health plans are doing this. So many, what they're looking at is zip codes. And what they're doing is they're looking at geographical factors first to identify individuals for screening. So it really helps, you know, them looking at a large scale macro level, who are these pop or what, which populations do we want to target for screening and then identifying them. So they just had a case study they recently published. Humana, again, not to call us Humana, I know the other health plans, Blue Cross Blue Shields has been doing it as well, where they have targeted, and then from a health plan perspective, perspective has targeted specific health centers based on their pop the populations they serve and then having them conduct a screening. Um, so those are where we do see that blend and a significant opportunity in the market for it. So I, I know I have a couple more slides. So Daniel, if it's okay for me to move yeah, forward and then we can continue. <laughs> yep, you're the driver. My apologies you're the driver. For, for slowing you down. No, no problem. So we talked about all these uses of the data, but um, one thing that is really important to know before we can even use the data, it needs to be better captures in the systems predominantly being used in healthcare settings, which is EHRs. But we know from an EHR perspective that if it isn't documented, it never happened. You could say more that if it is encoded, it never happened. And this is because as, as more data um, is documented in a standardized and structured way, it is easily or more, more useful. So then it brings us to um, making sure uh, my slides can move forward. So why capture social risk data in a standardized and structured way? So very much even in our conversation we just had, it is around promoting the collection and the use of the data across disparate system, across different provider groups. We also want to facilitate sharing of the data across organizations, both clinical and community-based, non-clinical, research-based. We want to be able to use the data across um, different organizations. And lastly, we want to facilitate payment for social risk data collection and intervention activities. So it brings us to what codes exist now to capture social risk data. Uh, In by the way, this is Brian. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I would add in that one other aspect, which is that while collection of this data is absolutely critical when it comes to coding it and including it in a patient record it needs to be coded not as a they have this circumstance but rather um, there is the potential that they have the circumstance. And that's something that's very difficult to encode um, in the current um, healthcare records. Yes. As, <laughs> as, 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 as one of so the federal health architects, <laughs> this is so a challenge. So I, I'm sure that Evelyn's going to address some of those things as we go forward and some of the challenges. I areas. hope so. so I just wanted to sort of lay that little, you know, if you will, hand grenade okay. on the table and say, we got to figure out how yeah. to do this. Okay. Yes. We will. So, so hold on. <laughs> hold on. We'll be talking about get it. The beef. This is coming. <laughs> So, um, so I want to start by acknowledging the study 20 and uh, siren completed 
on identifying what codes exist to represent social risk factors across these four leading medical terminologies. So ICD-10, WINT, SNOMED, CT, and CPT. So what they found was that there are a total, oh, why do I keep on? Sorry, everyone, it's not letting me advance. Okay, here we go. Um, so what they found, uh, so they looked, so before the finding, they looked for codes related to 20 social risk domains, specific within uh, the six leading screening tools. So this is not to say these are the only screening tools being used across the country. These are leading screening tools. And what they did is just conduct a study listed, the link is there provided at the bottom, to identify how each one of these um, what concepts are represented with them that are applicable to 20 social risk domains. And we'll talk about, I also have a snapshot of that towards the end of the slide, but they just wanted to investigate whether there could be, there were codes available. And what they found that there were 1,095 codes um, across these, you know, to, available to represent concepts within these 20 social risk domains. The majority, so I think to Brian's point, not all were up. The majority were around assessment and diagnosis data concepts, some around screening question and treatment interventions, very little around screening procedure codes. However, despite there being so many codes, they were not well aligned with the six social risk screening tools, meaning the questions being posed in the tool weren't uh, one-to-one -one being represented in the codes applicable for those concepts. So again, you know, they weren't being defined in the right ways. So this brings us to what we're doing within the Gravity Project, which is addressing both of these challenges, the absence of codes to represent the concepts and the overabundance of similar codes. Because what they found in their study was that there were also duplicity of codes, meaning that when it comes to actual implementation, then many EHR vendors are on the site didn't know which code to use to represent a concept because they had more than one choice and no guidance. So it brings us to our goals. Um, the Gravity Project is centered around addressing what concepts need to be documented around social determinants of health, what codes exist to reflect these concepts, and what codes are missing. Our current phase is focused on three social determinants of health domains, food and security, housing and stability and quality, and transportation access. I mentioned SIREN looked across 20 social determinants of health domains. It's not to say those other 17 are not important. What they found were these were three domains that health systems felt should be a priority to start documenting and addressing within the clinical setting. As we move on with the project, we hope to address additional domains. And of course, being here today is saying, what, uh, what of the other remaining domains can be applicable and addressed through this collaborative. That brings us to our next discussion question. Is your organization currently using medical terminologies to code SDOH data? And if yes, which codes and for what activities? No one's using codes? <laughs> no one's using <laughs> codes. Is, no one's using codes. Okay, no problem. I'll, I'll continue. But something to think through, because I, I, I know that comes up, it's, it's not coded, it never happens. So how are you being able to follow up? And most of them claim, including your claims. Evelyn, I have a quick question related to this one. In terms of, mm -hmm. you know, one of the big EHR vendors has a social determinant uh, module. And uh, I'm assuming that they're coding, you know, when they're, when people subscribe to them or integrate them, they have a whole mm -hmm. coding project or a whole coding ontology that they're using. Uh, are, yeah. are, are, are they going to have to adapt to the new coding in terms of, if it's assuming it gets adopted nationally, is that going to standardize it? So whoever yes, they are? Yes, it would. And, and it is the vendors, uh, absolutely. They have come back and that's one of the main issues the EHR vendors say is like where they're being asked by their clients to enable um, uh, documentation of social risk factors. Right. And so they've gone on their own end and mapped to, you know, identify, and that's where they said, you know, which ones to use for what. So um, we've known some of the, uh, the leading EHR vendors in the large ones have identified which ones to use, but they're not doing it in a consistent or standardized manner. So they have actually been ones that have been vocal saying, tell us which codes to use. Right, great, great. I have a. Oh, I have another question, Adam Pertman. Um, 
And this is really for the group as much as for you, Evelyn. How much, and, and please somebody speak up so that we think you're still there. Um, how much of this is cultural? In other words, you know, are there, is there, a, a, how deep is understanding that, yes, we have to share, we have to play with others, and therefore, you know, coding and everything else uh, in order to share is going to have to be done in some collaborative way with inclusion of other people so that we can get information transmitted and how so how much of it is technical in other words and how much is just organizations saying look we got to do what we got to do we got to get through tomorrow and get into next week and we can't deal with all of these other factors you know whether it connecting with other folks how much are, are those cultural issues a part of the conversation Oh, that's one of the biggest challenges, and that's what's addressed even in the NAM report, is that from sure. a workflow perspective and even provider burden perspective, they, you know, they, it's hard enough for clinicians to deal with clinical issues and problems, and here we are wanting to address social social needs. So for them, it's, you know, it's definitely something is where, you know, what, what can be done at the, within the clinical setting, but all, you know, say most interventions will be completed on the community-based side. They, they have to be. And so it's sort of like how these two um, systems, I say all players across the ecosystem can better play with each other. Again, ultimately is about improving whole person care. And so just having the clinical team take care of acute clinical issues is not going to impact the overall being of a person. So they have to work together. So it's figuring out what how can we support them from a data infrastructure perspective so that they have the right tools and technologies that will allow them to do so? Especially when you're asking um, such sensitive mm -hmm. questions like, do you have food insecurity? Or do you feel comfortable in your home? Do you have a home? Those are all things that are potentially embarrassing mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to a patient and they may not be willing to answer um, honestly under the circumstance. Absolutely. And that more work is, that's what I would call very implementation level. That is out of scope for our gravity project. So um, but it's definitely something that still needs to happen. And we talk about it, you know, we're just our scope. I'm going through scope right now. Um, we'll only touch, like I, I was sharing with um, the SOC team yesterday, we're really around sort of setting the ground for building the house or setting, you know, uh, laying the foundation for the, the highway. Um, more needs to happen to move forward. And it's it just, we're, we're starting that stage. So at least things are done and built in a consistent manner and you have the right data to act upon. But all these other areas, as you mentioned, still need more work. There needs to be more evidence. Um, but I will acknowledge there has been lots of study recently um, where they have surveyed patients about how they feel at answering these types of questions, you know, because that comes up as a barrier, you know, patients aren't gonna feel comfortable answering that question. And so a lot, of, but many of them have indicated a majority that they do, they would like to be asked. They would like their clinical provider to ask them the question. They can choose not to answer, but you know, so that, that's something that is emerging. Again, more evidence is needed. Um, and of course, as we work through this, it's figuring out how can you ask those questions and, and our use case, I will talk about it, does uh, support the individual answering those questions on their mobile app and consenting so they make that choice whether they want to answer the questions, how they want to do so, um, and then whether they want to share their responses with the, the clinical care team. And my reason for raising it is not to uh, denigrate mm -hmm. asking the question or you know, pointing out its limitations, but to rather say, you know, in addition to asking the question, boy, you know, if you also give them an opportunity to answer that question by an app, they may be more willing to answer it um, yeah. more honestly. And um, by the way, you know, local information, whether it's census information, uh, economic development information, et cetera, might provide uh, if not 
a better solution, a better answer, but an additional bit of feedback uh, for mm -hmm. those answers. Brian, let me interrupt. I, I, and I say that very uh, carefully because just because mm -hmm. an area is um, economically challenged, it doesn't mean that a particular person is economically challenged. On the other hand, if somebody is saying that they're not economically ah. challenged, and yet the environment is uh, absolutely destitute, you have to have an op opportunity to go, um, or what's really going Evelyn, I think you can move on. Yeah, I keep on, I don't know, Dan, if you're moving your screen. There you go. Ends yeah, up, there you go. It ends up kicking me out. <laughs> okay, keep going. Keep going there. Uh, sorry. I think we'll ask Brian yeah. to hold his comments to uh, the question and answer at the end there. He's getting enthusiastic about the uh, the potential topics here. So, yeah. Thanks. So, I, Thank I want to acknowledge our scope of work again, patient yeah. level data documentation. So, um, here's our conceptual framework. I have to start just explaining that, you know, we are looking around data concepts that can be documented and shared across four activities of screening, diagnosis, goal setting, and interventions, regardless of the initial input system. So it could be starting with a person or a patient's digital app where they can complete the screening questionnaire. Could be the clinical provider's EHR where they verbally administer the, the screening questions and then document the findings. Um, it could be the interdisciplinary team's uh, community-based IT system where they um, receive a referral or receive a, a copy of the care plan or action plan and address it. Um, we also wanna recognize the opportunity this framework has for secondary or upstream users of data, uh, users of data, as I say, such as public and private payers and researchers and public health officials who want to seek and use the data to inform payment reform, population health, and quality improvement initiatives. So it brings us to our scope. Our scope of phase one is developing use cases. So identifying and developing use cases, defining common data elements in associated concept domains, specific to food and security, housing, and transportation, and then coming up with recommendations on how to group and code these based on existing standards. So um, we, again, like I said, any uh, future phases might include other use cases and uh, additional domains. In August of this year, we became a fire accelerator project, joining all the other accelerators listed here. Um, so I won't go into detail what a fire accelerator is, but that there's a link and that was really important to advance our work as we are ultimately focused in developing fire implementation guides. Since we kicked off the gravity project, it was always designed, regardless even when we went public, um, for rapid uptake into existing and a, an upcoming interoperability and standard acceleration project. So as, as you see here in the visual, just quickly, our three, we're working on the three data sets. As we transition to phase two next year, we'll develop and test coded value sets for use in fire. Those will be available for any project use. So even if there are fire, as, as um, Dave talked about earlier, we can, you know, this, these would be available for use. And then we're also developing a fire IG. And then we intend, based on us being a fire accelerator, you see a series of initiatives there on the right-hand side. Um, again, very all focused on fire acceleration, and we hope for them to use our, our work. So the next question, and I don't know, Dan, if you want me to stop here, just conti um, continue going in the interest of time. I think, we're, uh, I think we're pretty good on time. I know that there was Rich Bolin, I think, had a question. Um, okay. on, so we'll just take a couple minutes here. Yeah, we're, we're just approaching one o'clock, so we're, we're good. We're good? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let me address Rich Bolin. One comment from the Child Welfare Guy, collecting information for ACs has resulted in evolution of different systems. So did, that would, would that fall under the other, the community-based system? Yeah, so it was just kind I of- I them on there. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It was kind of just um, along the, the the same conversation that we we're having in terms of getting good data from all these different systems mm -hmm. that really feed into. So we've been actively working, and is just out in California recently, um, working with the um, Surgeon General there, um, Dr. Burke Harris, 
and we were talking about collecting this information um, when folks may still have a fear that it may result in an unwanted referral into a system like a child welfare system because I, I indicate to you that I've had these challenges or problems in the past. Um, and, and then that may look so um, it was just one of the other things that I think is really important um, to, you know, when, when that individual, when that actual participant is the one that is the best source of the real data, um, finding other ways in which it already exists without putting them in a position where they're answering it again and again and again, if it already exists. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, and I do, one of our use cases, again, we, we have it as a question, the role of an HIE or a CIE, um, the ability to query, or as we have more open APIs available, I think to that point is, you know, even all those activities we talk about screening, it's no, uh, initially we would want to, if, you know, our story is around the clinical setting, but if a clinical provider has access to community-based data already, they can query, you know, whether or not that individual has already completed a questionnaire or, you know, any or any, any other data that can inform. Um, because as we will talk through what our use cases are, is a really support encouraging the primary care practice to pre-populate that questionnaire with existing data and, you know, to be very specific, like ask questions, don't ask questions that the patient's already answered for another provider. Perfect. Okay. Moving right along. Do you want me to ask, do you want me to ask this question, Dan, oh, or yeah. open it up? Yeah, I think. Or do you yeah, answer we, this? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so, so what is um, this? Yeah, what I, is the question? Yeah. So the question here is why does the inter interoperability glide path not include existing national initiatives around community-based uh, right. data exchange, right. right? So these right. are all regulators, vendors. So I will say per, this is, again, a highlight and opportunity for this group as, uh, as a whole is that there isn't a robust you know, it's a national level interoperability, community-based interoperability um, initiative, right? So it's something that as you evolve and you continue through through the work that this would also pipe, pipe in there, right? So it's acknowledging the opportunity because this did come up, especially from our gravity participants that said, what happened to the community-based initiatives? We said, you know, if you have, these are all national level um, efforts, the ones through um, HSBC and HL7 are international efforts. Um, so it's an opportunity to uh, have more visibility there or, or to stand up something. Great. Evelyn, we have a, one more question. Uh, Karen Smith. Uh, Karen, are you on still? So former director of public health, California. I, I am. I just wanted to point out one reason that, that they, that the the GlideSlack doesn't include the sorts of community-based um, mm -hmm. interoperability efforts is that the healthcare system remains um, very isolated. Mm -hmm. And the reason we have national effort, there are two reasons I think, well, two main reasons that we have national efforts for healthcare. The most important one is just how much healthcare costs and the belief that you could save money by doing this and that therefore brings investment of money by national players. But the other is that communities are really very, very, very different. And so it's difficult to imagine how you create, uh, it's not impossible, I believe, but it is difficult to think about how you do an actual national effort around community data exchange <clears throat> and then link that to healthcare. Yeah, a great point, Karen. absolutely. You, you know, I just, I'll throw in one thing here uh, around that. Yesterday I was at the, um, the WIND Network, which is part of the 100 Million Healthier Lives Initiative. Mm -hmm. People are familiar with that. It's called like the Wellbeing Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, and they are actually establishing national population health level metrics uh, with over 100 different organizations are participating in defining those. So Karen, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that or others are. I was, I was absolutely blown away by the collaborative mm -hmm. effort to start to address some of those national level. You know, there's the the ground level stuff that's going on, of course, that has to happen in every community, but then how do you, you know, how do you do top down and bottom up? And so it's very interesting. In fact, I asked uh, Shoma Stout, who is the director of that and IHI to, uh, to uh, participate on one of our calls coming up and she agreed uh, to come on uh, probably maybe in December, or early January to talk a little bit about that initiative and the metrics and, 100 million lives, it's very impressive. And it, you know, all these pieces sort of nest together, right? From getting the codes right on the most high value sort of exchanges to 
uh, sort of national metrics approaches. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out. It seemed like an opportune time, but um, uh, thanks, Karen. Yeah, this is Karen. Yeah. I agree with that, and and it's it's fabulous work. It's it's just where is the big money that actually turns that work into um, actual um, implementation going to come from at a national level? That's harder to figure out. A question to okay. be uh, to pondered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It. All right. Well, let's we'll continue. Um, right. So I'll. I'll um, so uh, our approach to date, so we want to acknowledge again that the Gravity Project is executed as a multi-stakeholder, public, open, transparent process um, using the HL7 Confluence Wiki. So our link is included here. Anyone is invited to, you know, we've invited, we've cast a really wide net to invite stakeholders across um, clinical and non-community and clinical and non-clinical settings, um, organizations, associations. So this is, even though it's housed under HL7, it is not specifically targeting implementers or clinical informaticians. We really um, encourage a breadth of um, SDOH stakeholders to participate. And um, so it's led us to where we are today. Um, so we are over 800 participants. We have a link at the bottom. So we also encourage um, anyone who joins us to take a look of who's already on the list. Mm -hmm. And often they find that folks on their organizations are already there. Um, but of course we invite, again, like we said, it's free, it's open, anyone can join. Um, we do our best to ensure that it, it is multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholders. So this gives you uh, a snapshot of the different organizations. Um, and, we're, and we continue to grow. So this brings us also to our governance structure. Um, we are grateful for having a very diverse advisory steering committee. That includes Nick. Um, so we have Margot Edmonds, who sits, uh, of course, Academy Health and, and Nick. She sits on our steering committee. We have several, uh, several federal health agencies. And of course, we have payers and associations. And as we move on to be a fire accelerator, um, our governance structure will slightly change, um, but we will, we will always encourage having diver diversity um, in our uh, advisory committee. So here's our roadmap. We kicked off this initiative as a public initiative on May 2nd. So we've come a long way. Um, the line in the middle is to highlight where we are today, November 1st. Uh, we are close, as it's stated here, where we are close to finishing uh, the food insecurity data set and de identification. Um, we've completed our use case work. That was one of our first deliverables. And we're tackling each domain data set identification one by one. So once we finish food insecurity, we'll move on to housing and then move on to transportation. And then in the new year, that we'll also work with our executive committee and advisory committees to identify additional domains to work on. So that is yet to be seen, but this is our roadmap so far. At the same time, we kicked off our fire um, implementation guide development. I'll talk about it in a, a few more slides, but this will continue on until next year. So pause for our next question here. Um, your project kicked off in May and you are near completion of the food and security data set. How can individuals get involved at this stage? Is it too late? Absolutely not. Um, as I mentioned, anyone can join anytime. Um, I, the, when you go on our landing page, you will also have access to every single meeting we've had to date. We post all our um, presentations and, and a recording of our presentations. And then we also have homework for every public meeting. We meet Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time that will be available. And we, at this time, especially, you know, we're getting ready to publish the food and security data set for consensus voting. If you are, do sign up. And I know we've got several um, uh, Gravity participants on, on the call today. Um, you'll get a chance to vote on it. So, um, you know, if you do want to be involved at that level, um, absolutely. And then of course, when we kick off the other domains, we would want uh, more participation. Thanks. Any Evelyn, other questions? Oh. Yeah, I think Paul. I think Paul Nelson has a comment or a question. Paul, you there? Hmm. Okay, maybe not. 
Do you want to read it out? Oh, okay. Uh, here, we go. Gonna, hey, here we go. Uh, oh, here we go. I, I, I think yeah. the, our, our, our national uh, uh, capability to manage uh, all these social determinants is, is really inhibited greatly by the fact that we don't have a means, a uh, nationally coordinated, mean, coordinated means to assure that primary health care is, is uh, equitably available to each citizen within every community. And so we don't have a way to emphasize the importance of primary health care to coordinate the data acquisition, I would say. And, 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 and to have too many people involved in that means that the primary physicians don't do it at all because it's too chaotic. And, and therein mm -hmm. lies the basis for uh, manage any kind of, sec uh, of security commons uh, uh, that might uh, take care of, have a, a local basis to manage the adversities that are, that are driven uh, locally. So I, I, I think the, the project is meaningful and important to in the long run, but I, I'd say the difficulty of implementation is, uh, especially with the isolation of the healthcare system itself, is incredible. So I, I, uh, I really uh, admire your uh, uh, um, willingness to to uh, to uh, <laughs> sort of access the uh, difficulties involved. They are, they are, Siren is, Siren is an awesome group if you haven't gotten to know them, so. Uh, well, uh, I, I will, I will take care of that. <laughs> Go ahead, Evelyn. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you. No, we hear you. That's why we don't, we're not tackling implementation, but we acknowledge it, you know, it, more work definitely needs to happen. All right, so I'll, I'll move on um, to our next uh, update. So I'm going to now just give a sense of where we're at. And again, we'll pause again for questions. What have we developed today? So the roadmap, the visual show that we've already completed our use case um, development um, series of activities with the community. And this um, was a very good exercise working uh, with the community at large and identifying a use or use cases to represent social determinants of health documentation and EHRs. And as part of this process, so we have a link there and I encourage you to please peruse, take some time to re review our use case package we spent significant time, like our, it explains our approach, and our approach was around identifying personas, so using user-centered design principles of really acknowledging who are these users of the system, who are those contributing data, and creating fictional personas um, to represent them. And then we developed, we put all these personas together in a patient story. And the patient story was really helpful in defining what are those data transactions, high value data transactions needed to, um, you know, to support data and interoperability around SDOH data? So based on that, we came up with three, we identified three use cases as listed here um, to represent what we say those high value transactions in the patient story. So our first use case is around documenting SDOH data in conjunction with the patient encounter. And this involves those activities of requesting um, the individual, the patient to complete a screening questionnaire and having that individual consent, you know, complete, agree to complete it, consent to share it with their clinical team, and then having the clinical provider use their EHR system to be able to access that data and integrate it into the EHR. So it is transactions involved, uh, involved around those two, um, two separate uh, systems. The second one is around action, so documenting and tracking SDOH related interventions to completion. So this includes um, all, inter you know, what we say closing the loop, being able to refer the individual based on social needs identified um, to community-based providers, being able to um, uh, generate a care plan and share it with another um, of the care team members, not on the clinical side. Um, the, avail the ability, and we'll talk about interventions in, that in the coming slides. So, but this is really around taking action on what was documented in use case one. And finally, use case three is the gathering and aggregation of all this data for uses beyond the, the point of care. So this is where we say data can be used for population health management, quality reporting, and risk adjustment. But we focus on the action of aggregation, and it is very much dependent on the other two being completed. 
So what does this look like? So the next, in the interest of time, I'm just going to give you snapshots of how these use cases are represented uh, in the uh, uh, use case package. And when we start moving into the technical realm, we have to represent these using what we call actor transaction diagrams. So here is a representation of the first one for the clinical encounter. And we talk about actors as both, you know, human actors, the clinical staff member, the patient, um, the uh, system actor, the EHR, the screening app on the patient's mobile app. And then we also have business actors or entities. In this case, it is the PCP practice. And we focus our work, again, really very much honing in on what the scope of our patient level data exchanges. It's these transactions that move from these two systems, right? So our work, our project is solely focused on the payload or what we say the message content that moves from one system to another or shares from one system to another. So always keeping that through. And in this case, it is an SBOH questionnaire that is sent or you know published on the um, made available on the mobile app. The mobile app, the patient uses the mobile app to complete the questionnaire and then allows it accepts it to be shared with the EHR system. Huh. And when we move on to use case two, so again, same thing, same focus around uh, order, you know, uh, one system sharing with another. In this case, we have many types of interventions that are identified. Um, and so we just acknowledge there is a request sent from one system to another, and that request is completed. And that request may be a referral, that request may be an order, new medication order, or it could be um, a consult, you know? So it could be different types, but again, we focus on the payload, what gets in the middle that is, that is shared across the disparate system. The third use case is then, I think having all the two-on-one uh, team on the call, this is applicable very much in the HIEs, what they do right now is where we now introduce a middleware system. Not to say that this middle, where system is not applicable to the other use cases, you can very much have some integrator um, be able to move data from the EHR to a screening app. Um, but in this case, we show it around a, a aggregation. So here we acknowledge that the middleware system could be a clearinghouse for claims, a health information service provider, a community information exchange, a health information exchange. They can serve that role of being able to pull the data and aggregate it and then send it to another entity that will use it, right? So in this case, it's a payer, but we, you know, this is really around being able to pull data, aggregate it, and then have another system conduct analytics on it or use the data for um, upstream uses. So um, on, ju on July 18th, yes, yeah, we uh, kicked off our food insecurity domain and we asked our, our participants to submit uh, what data, the food and security data concepts they were currently using in their organization. We did not ask them to send us codes. We just said, what are those screening questions you're asking? How, what are diagnosis concepts you're using? Uh, what are goals, if you are capturing any goals and what interventions? And so we um, were fortunate to receive very diverse data sets from 19 organizations. So you have them listed here. Um, and then you can, I also will encourage you, uh, again, everything is transparent on our Confluence site. You will find here a master data list. You also see lots of homework for our community because we've, we're going to review. Um, but we ask them to start, you know, submit these data concepts in terms of what's, again, used for screening, diagnosis, goal setting, and intervention. And it was very helpful in getting us to where we are today and in, 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 as part of our end-to-end -end review. So just this, what do I mean by data concept? So it's important for me to acknowledge that not everyone's gonna send us this question answer sets around screening, that food and security documentation exists across all these activities. So this is just a snapshot of questions that were submitted. I mean, data concepts that were submitted. Uh, so you get a sense of what we mean by each one. Um, so, you know, a screening, you would have a question answer set. Um, in the middle, some noted observations that are made based on the um, uh, results of the screening. Um, then a diagnosis, the formal assessment and diagnosis conducted based on the screening results. Um, and then the ability to work with the patient on identifying goals to address 
the social risks identified. And then lastly, in prevention, where we spent most of our time because this is, I would say, the meat of a lot of what we're doing is really finding the right labeling, the, the interventions correctly. Um, so that brings us to our interventions framework. Uh, so again, this is this was new based uh, based on all the submissions we received and feedback from the community. Um, the leads, I said, you know, there's a better way to um, define these interventions and group them. So what they found was, I mean, they developed what we call this infrastructure intervention structure, intervention framework around eight types or different types of interventions. And this will also help on how we propose new codes be developed by, in particular, many of these are CT, um, would be applicable to SNOMED CT. So they're, as they're listed here, you know, to person, a role, a provision of the service, counseling, patient, assessment of, some, uh, of an activity, assistance with something. So, and we have this again all in our, our in our um, you can see it, again when you log into our slides you'll be able to see um, in each intervention type. So um, I mentioned we for IG so I will say this is our roadmap for our fire implementation guide development. I know it's hard to see on the small screen um, but as part of we task five we have been um, Sponsored, I would say, and again, uh, thanking the American Medical Association for helping us move this part forward. So, um, our target to ballot for those similar seven process will go through the formal process for publishing a standard. And we intend to do a for trial STU um, for September 2020. HL7 had uh, recently created new guidelines for anything, any fire and guide that is relative, it needs to, to have two connect been connected in two connected for the ballot. So this allowed us to backwards and say we need to schedule two connected on So this is also my pitch for those who haven't heard already as part of the gravity call that um, we are to connect definitely one in May of 20 as part of the A7 um, May connect in San Antonio. We're currently looking to stand up a gravity only connectathon either in March or April um, to test use case one and three and then get, test all the use case um, one, two, and three in the May connectathon. We'll all hold uh, another connectathon part of the September working group, but we want you to inform the ballot. I think the oh, sorry before we go into there. So this leaves us again question about the integration with other work. We are we recognize a lot of our work, a lot of the standards to support the transactions I just walked through already exist. Um, you know the the gap is around the data concepts for security. So this is a, a out of the um, what we say the profiles and resources to reuse. Um, based on those that already exist. So again, we're building off DaVinci, we're building off the U.S. under Argonaut. We're looking at other implementation guides already developed and existing. Um, we will be creating new profiles. So the only new things that we'll be creating in the IG is we'll now have a food and security observation profile and a food security observation profile. So though this is coming up um, and that will be included in the IG. So this leads us a pause before we go into um, the next area. And I think there's a question, a question already. Number two is really hard. Yeah, okay. So I failed. This is the case number two. That's what it sounds like. Be far from the medical world. Yes. <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> and there, there's lots of, but part of it, this is where we need to we need to do a better job as a health system that you know again if you're just seeing the um admission you know again looking at our patient and you're not um changes to the individual's home is impacting their asthma it really your intervention your clinical intervention will not be useful. so the types of things we all need to work on together as a community but we have assumptions, you know, a lot of what we see now have in-site in visit, in-home training programs, and 
being able to connect the clinical providers with the community-based organizations, very much with the two ones they're doing and the community referral platforms that are market right now. Um, just, you know, our work is really standardizing those data concepts. They can be readily shared across different care team members. Rita has a question. Do you envision certain transactions being more for example, when information may be requested versus pushed? Um, I think just, uh, I think a lot of the, the resources and things are um, already exist. So for us is just, post, I don't, I think it's just, it will depend on the infrastructure exists uh, around the implementation. You know, they already have data sharing agreements and they really already Query an individual's patient now saying, can clinical providers query for community data or non clinical data? And then, can you use that same agreement to pull data into the um, part, whether it's clinically based or community based data? Um, uh, Evelyn, just are you uh, on a headset? It's breaking up a little bit. So, I don't know if other people are hearing that as well. Or are you on the computer line? No, I'm on uh, my earphone. Okay. It's just a little, uh, I don't know if something shifts a little bit, so we just made it a little bit more difficult to hear. Um, but um, Okay, I can get closer. Yeah. Okay. Did, I, did you miss something or did you reiterate anything before we jump into the next, the last section? No, nope. I just, it just, um, it just was, um, uh, just little, every other, every few words were a little hard to hear, but I think, it's, I think it's fine. I think you can continue, and we can move move through move forward the remainder of the slides. All right. So these slides are around considerations for the um, SDOA data interoperability. So this is putting in, as I mentioned earlier, we're not addressing everything under gravity, and there's an opportunity to encourage, you know, bring a, a larger group together. So I start by acknowledging the six NIC domains uh, Dan presented earlier. Oh, breaking up. Let me just yeah, a little bit. Try this. Uh, you know what? Let me, um, maybe, uh, Sunday, is that a good that idea? Let me, oh, yeah, say a few words here. Let me, let's hear. Go ahead, say some more. No, not, not terribly. Um, let me, I'm going to grab the screen and see if that maybe moves it a little bit um, and just tell me to move it. So go ahead and speak now. Let's see what happens. I think I took over the screen there. Okay. <laughs> so it was meant to just, again, acknowledge a lot of doing in community um, easily in here, especially now we're focused on human and social services and health IT. So just a, those are the pieces Then you have all the areas but there's still uh you know there is current work in it and again doing the work with self seven so it's an opportunity to be able to the dots around all these six and what focus great all right we next slide, yeah. next slide. Yep. there we go okay so i also want to recognize the communities because i look to not we just will not be these in grad as we look across 20 domains, um, as an example, what in touch of immigration infrastructure and maritime, these are areas where, again, say this can, it can play a key role, but I feel like a lot of lessons learned, data, element simulation, um, data and trackability, be applied to these other um, communities in the same, and, you know, to support um, liquidity. Right. Next slide. Slide. Um, when I talk about domains, I mentioned siren on 20 across 20 domains. I know that there is, you know, a debate still on what are our social of health domains. So uh, I want to acknowledge that, you know, there is still more there, um, but as I here included those Pfizer Foundation. And I want to acknowledge right now we just focused on three on three and so many more systems and figuring out what will this 
opportunity to which ones are when should be taxed under next an example is them being taxed under gravity so uh -huh. again opportunity next slide are just a recap of the next if you move to the next one um, again I, I made some recommendations included the recommendation yeah so the report I had earlier you know good about um, provide summary of today but there is section have a clear foundation around building a social digital infrastructure so important for this community to, again to know be aware of and you know how you know how again how can Nick how can the community um, based you know infrastructure fit into this health ecosystem as well so you know um, as the second to last bill is just provide support for deploying interoperable platforms for communities. So if we have a way, very much like financial data is interoperable right now, transportation data is interoperable from an airline perspective, you know, we, we need to get there for health and human service data. Next slide. And then lastly, for those not aware, there is a bipartisan bill. So again, acknowledging the um, interest overall and being able to address and support uh, states in, uh, and you know, knowing that there are, especially in New York, I know we've been doing a lot of work with New York, um, you know, there's just an opportunity here. And so just keep that on the radar. So with that, um, I will stop. Last, uh, that's the last of the. Slide. Thank you, Evelyn. That was great. Um, uh, it's, uh, I, I feel like I've got a, a better sense of all the, uh, the work you're doing and the, uh, the, uh, the roadmap you have got there. And it seems like, you know, it's early on, but it's got a, it's got a pretty ambitious goal, which is amazing. Uh, and some standardization there. Just in the few minutes we've got here, I don't know if anyone has a particular comment or question we can address, and then we'll, we'll close up in just a couple of seconds here, a couple of minutes. Hi, this is Jim Kirkwood from New York State Department of Health. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, I, you know, thanks for the presentation. This is great. I think that some of the, I think these sort of the, the use cases and how the data is flowing is going to solve quite a few problems that we've heard from a lot of our providers, pediatricians especially. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the concerns from them is that um, they will do a referral for something and then not hear back and they end up referring yeah. multiple times to things. And so that's, one of the things we're trying to do is to figure out how do we fit this within our infrastructure, within our HIEs, and of course within and so how, does, how does Medicaid support this and everything too. So this is great, and thank you. Great, yeah, absolutely. And that that actually you will see from our patient story. Um, we initially it would have been great if you know they, for example, um, in our story that the patient is referred out to SNAP, the care coordinator refers them out to SNAP benefit, you know, or counsels them on uh, applying for SNAP benefits, but they don't know uh, whether or not the patient did apply because there's no closed week for SNAP benefits. So they'd have to wait until the follow-up appointment to have the patient acknowledge they completed their enrollment. All right. All right. Well, thanks uh, again, Evelyn, for the presentation. I'm glad that everything is available and open, and I'm sure you'll be inundated with new uh, adherence to uh, supporting gravity. <laughs> I mean, the gravity may be getting a little heavier for that matter, um, but I uh, hope you can stay aloft, as it were. Um, just a, two other quick comments. Um, all this will be archived. Uh, the comments will be archived, the, the, the uh, presentation, so you can share it, look at it again, and if there's questions that we didn't address, we'll try to address those online and, and, um, and um, implore uh, Evelyn to address some of the questions that we can't answer ourselves. Um, and then, yeah. so just for folks who want to join next week, uh, we have Dave Ross, as I said, who's, reading, who's leading the, uh, uh, the, the Gates Global Health Initiative. And um, for those of you who know Dave or the work at the, uh, the, uh, the um, Public Health Informatics Institute, he's an incredible guy and has got uh, many decades of experience doing um, health-related public health work, and uh, it's just, it should be a great conversation. Following week, as I said, we'll have an open house to dive more into the POC and some cross, uh, try to bring back some of the presenters to have a little more cross-sector conversation. And then the following week, and you'll see all this on, online, is we have a presentation from Ann Flagg from the American Public Human Services Association about the new child welfare uh, family first uh, um, legislation, uh, which intersects very closely with Medicaid. 
and prevention and many of the topics here, and particularly around social determinants. Uh, and then you'll be seeing ongoing, you'll see more, um, you'll see more um, um, uh, scheduled uh, discussions or presentations. We're kind of mixing it up on this group, but we're hoping mm -hmm. to keep the 12 to 1.30 time on Fridays. I know it's a big commitment. And here's my soapbox. Last statement is, you know, collaboration doesn't happen without people taking the time to do it. And yeah. it really, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah. we talk about it. We always talk about it. But uh, I think one of the things I'm most gratified about is people are showing up to these calls or listening they're participating, some more enthusiastically than others. Um, but we appreciate that as well. And uh, so, you know, carve out time, join the hub. There's, as I said, almost 900 people on there. And we'll have a schedule that will run through probably uh, February. We'll be posting that over the next couple of weeks there. So stay engaged, ask your questions. And um, I think that's it for today. Have a great weekend. And I uh, hope everybody's got a big bag of candy from yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, right, everyone, everybody. and thank good. you, Daniel. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah.